Good morning, church. Good morning, Rock of Roseville. Good to see you. Happy Christmas week. I hope you are doing well. I hope last week was awesome for you. I pray this week is full of peace, full of order. Uh, I am really excited. I'm excited to be back. I was in uh, Puerto Vallarta. No, not Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Rico. So many Puertas. Uh, Puerto Rico with my wife. We spent 10 days there. It was the longest vacation we've ever had in 36 years of marriage. Incredibly relaxing and peaceful, but I missed you. Welcome to the people who are watching online from The Rock, as well as other states and other countries. Um, what, what a great week. You know, we got home last night. Uh, my youngest son, who lives in Austin, Texas, came. He's going to be with us through the holidays. Uh, found out uh, my oldest child, Joel, is pregnant with child. Um, gosh, I mean, just so many things to be thankful for. Uh, youngest grandson, who was born on Easter, five minutes before I went out to speak, if you remember, uh, has said his first words of, I love you. Said it twice this morning. Said it to his dad. I'm sure it was intended for me, but hey, in times to come. We're excited. I want to talk about preparing for the promise. That's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, talking about Jesus. It's going to be awesome. I want to say this at the onset, you know, uh, Christmas seasons bring a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure uh, for people, for Christians, for churches that feel the need to perform. Uh, and I just want to say, I'm reminded of a time when I was speaking, and it was about, I'm going to say about 20 years ago, and I got done with my message, and an 11-year-old girl came up to me, and she had a piece of paper in her hand. You know, and that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. And she came up, and she said, Pastor Bob, I just want you to know that I kept score on your message. I went, oh, no, this isn't going to be good. An 11-year-old paying attention. And so she showed me this little score sheet, and she had the words, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and Father written down with marks next to each one of those on how many times I said each word, God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. She said, you referred to God 12 times. You referred to the Holy Spirit 17 times. You referred to Jesus 18 times. And I'm like, who does this? And my first, you know, I was, I was amazed that one, she paid attention, she listened closely. And then the second thing I was amazed at, I thought, you know what? That's a lot of God. That's a lot of Jesus. That's a lot of the Father. That's a lot of the Holy Spirit. And I remember thinking, there was a lot of God in that message, and I'm grateful. You know, today, I, I want to encourage, I just want to say, I don't have anything necessarily cute or quippy or funny, and I don't have any, like, relevant movie quotes or movie lines or illustrations, but what I do have is some scripture. I have 10 verses. We're going to center in on the verse that we've been paying attention to in Isaiah chapter 9, one of the many messianic prophecies. There's over 300 messianic prophecies that have been fulfilled. We want to zero in on this one aspect of who Jesus is as the Prince of Peace. So follow along with me in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Think about that. Wonderful Counselor. Eternal wisdom that is present right now. Nobody knows you better and more thoroughly. Nobody knows your past, your present, current struggles that you're dealing with now, or what you're going to face tomorrow, except God himself. Jesus Christ himself is referred to as the wonderful counselor. He knows what to do with every aspect of your life. He has wisdom for your life. Jesus is wisdom personified. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 says that Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. He is that. He embodies it. He doesn't just have power accessible to him. He doesn't just have wisdom. He's not carrying around a little quote book of wisdom. He is personified. Wisdom and power. And he has that for you, for me, for us. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. And he's the prince of peace. Now, when you think about wisdom, you think about all the situations you and I face. And as I, as I was penning these words out, I was thinking about how much 
Jesus' wisdom is accessible and available to us. I think about what, you know, what, what uh, James the Apostle said over in James. He said, you know, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, freely, doesn't withhold, but ask in faith and don't doubt anything, and wisdom will be your portion. I think about Proverbs when it talks about wisdom, lengthy chapter. I think it's in chapter 2 or 3. It says, wisdom cries out in the streets, shouts from the rooftops. How long will you love simplicity? Oh, you simple ones. And then goes on and talks about wisdom's desire to have entrance into the hearts and the minds of men and women for every situation. You know, wisdom. I think about a friend of mine, actually a mentor in Singapore. And me and a brother from another country were on a Zoom call with him having a little mentoring session. And he was telling me about somebody that he discipled who became a lawyer, uh, an attorney for family and divorce. And he said, you know, you can be an attorney and you can make a lot of money and, you know, that's good. But you're a Christian. And I think the wisdom of God would be how can he use you as a redemptive tool into the life of people's whose marriages are ending. And so wisdom came to him. God spoke to him. And so what he does, and it's a fascinating story, what he does is when somebody uh, that wants a divorce calls his office and they start to ask, how much are the fees? He simply says, I have two fees. So one fee is however much he charges an hour. It's a lot. And he said, the second fee is free. And they said, well, what do you mean? So people don't understand. How could you be a divorce attorney and the fee is free? He said, what I've found over the years is most marriages don't need to end in divorce. And I have wisdom that if you'll listen to me, I can help your marriage get back together and we can avoid all those unnecessary costs of legal fees. And he has, through the years, saved many, 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 many couples from divorce. Why? Because of life in Christ and the wisdom of God. And then he says this, he adds this little caveat. He said, it's cost me a lot of money. <laughs> so it is costly. It does have a price to be paid. But that's the wisdom from God. You know, in the Old Testament, Messianic peace refers to the absence of hostility and a reconciled relationship with God and relationships. In the New Testament, when we talk about peace, it's referred to as completeness or wholeness or tranquility. Think about these words, security and deliverance. Deliverance being the state of being free from distress. You know, as I, I think about those words, I think about when Jesus lectured in the synagogue and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach, to bring sight to the blind, to remove the yoke of oppression. I mean, that's exactly what peace does. That's exactly who the Prince of Peace is and what what he does in our lives. It has the idea of wholeness, the idea of being intact. You ever hear people say, I just feel like I'm losing it. I'm coming apart at the seams. The idea of being intact. Not just looking like you got it together, but actually having a soundness where you are together. Not perfect, but without pretense. Integrated. What is in integrity is the sum of all parts together. That's, that's New Testament peace. It's the idea, when he says the prince of peace, the idea is he's a commander of peace. Once again, he just doesn't sprinkle peace around. It's not some ethereal thing. He's the commander of peace, and he commands with authority. And if you go through the Gospels and you see when Jesus, you know, preached and taught, many times it says, he speaks as one who has authority, not like we've ever heard, not like we've heard the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus was different. He was the Prince of Peace. He's a commander of peace. As a commander of peace, think Mark 4. You remember when they're, they're on the water, there's a storm that comes up. The disciples start freaking out. Jesus is asleep in the boat. The audacity of Jesus during an incredible turmoil, an incredible storm. I mean, all hell's breaking loose. Jesus is snoozing in the boat, and the disciples are freaking out. And they said, don't you care? We're perishing. You remember what Jesus does? He stands up, and he commands the winds, the source, the winds, and the waves 
to cease and desist. He commands it. Think about that. He wants to command peace in your life. He wants to command peace in my life. He wants to command peace in the world. He just doesn't have peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Think about John 20. I mean, arguably one of my favorite passages. Jesus has died. He's been crucified. He's been buried. Uh, He's resurrected. It says in John 20, the disciples are hiding behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. They're afraid they're next. They're hiding. They're huddling. They're restless. They're anxious. And Jesus walks through the door. And I love what he does. First, he shows his wounds. He shows them his piercings. What's he doing? He's affirming. I'm who I said I was. I am who I say I am, and it is me. And they freak out. They're terrified. And you know, Jesus says first three times after his resurrection, peace, peace, peace. Three times he says in an authoritative voice, peace to you, peace to you, peace to you. I love the fact that he can handle their doubts. I love, the, I love the fact that Jesus owns the chaos in their hearts. I love the fact that he commands peace. And where he commands peace, there is stillness. And they calm down. And they settle down. Chaos will always submit to the authority of the Prince of Peace. He owns it. John chapter 5 verse 1 says, or Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, think about what Jesus did for us doesn't mean that that we have just the peace of God, but we have peace with God. And in light of the the fact that we have a reconciled relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we're then called to be ministers of reconciliation of all people on the planet. Christ followers should bring peace wherever there's anxiety. I think we'd agree these times we live in are absolutely crazy. Since this has gone on since the beginning of the year, things have gotten worse and worse, and people are more anxious, more restless, more fearful. Ever a time for the church to step up and be the people of peace, it's now. I would encourage you that if you, and not to, not to be guilt here, Uh, or shame, but if you're just as freaked out as the world, what does that say about your walk with him? You know, you see many times Jesus kind of like, he doesn't kind of get their doubt. He doesn't kind of understand their unbelief. He kind of goes, why are you so afraid? And once again, the natural times where, you know, you think, well, yeah, this is is a situation that warrants freaking out. Jesus is kind of perplexed and doesn't get it. Because where his presence is, there is always peace. We need to lean into that. We really need to get a hold of that. We really need to grasp that. John chapter 14, verse 25. I mean, think about these verses here. Literally, hours before Jesus goes to the cross, he is still mindful of the state of people's hearts. What does he say? He says, these things I've spoken to you. What things? Man, if you, just, if you read John chapter 14, if you read John chapter 13, and you read John chapter 12, those three chapters, I tell you what, you can chew on those, thing, those, those verses for a long, long time. He talked about heaven. He talked about kingdom issues. He talked about relationship with him, relationships with one another, bearing fruit, how to stay close to him, um, all kinds of kingdom issues in those three chapters. And so he says, I've spoken these things while being present with you. Now think about it. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. The same Jesus who who spoke these things while being present with them is still speaking these things. He's still present with us today. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will not leave you orphans. He's still counseling. But the counselor the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. He's still helping. He's still counseling. And then he says, peace I leave with you. Now don't miss this. These two words, very profound, very emphatic. My peace I give to you, not as the world 
gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Literally, at the core of your being is where your heart is. Not just your physical heart, the spiritual part of who you are, the deep center, the heart. And he's ministering to their hearts. And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Literally means don't let it be agitated. Don't let it be full of anxiety. Don't let it be restless. Don't let it be distressed. Now what's interesting is during this pandemic, if you go to different psychological websites, CDC, etc., you will see during this pandemic, 40% of all U.S. adults report struggling with mental health or substance abuse. The suicide rates have gone up 1% before the pandemic, 145% up. That's the suicide rate. People are not coping well. People are missing peace. And you know, according to Jesus, there's two kinds of peace here. The first kind of peace is worldly. It's a carnal peace. It's the world's version of peace. It's a peace that's depending on circumstances. You know, if my circumstances are going good, I'm at peace. As soon as they go south, I'm agitated. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I'm restless. It's a carnal peace. It's a worldly peace. It's synthetic. It's temporary. It's situational. It's in pills. It's in bottles. It's in, ad in addictions that numb and dumb. There's a worldly way to get peace. You can stack your portfolio. You can, you can build your 401ks, your investment portfolio. I'm not saying those are wrong. I'm just saying that's a worldly way to build security. That if I have this, you know, this pinnacle of wealth, then I'll be at peace. It's not true. It's worldly. You can live in a gated community. I'm not saying it's wrong. Not saying it's bad. But it's a worldly way to have security. Politics, you can build walls, you can fund police, you can defund police. Sometimes people put their worldly peace in sentimentalism. You know, there'll be people this year, this Christmas, Christmas that will be thinking thoughts like these. If I do everything perfect, if I get everybody the right gifts, if we decorate the right way, if we stage our home the right way, if we have this idyllic, dinner with everybody and we serve the right food and the right hors d'oeuvres and everybody's dressed and I'll just tell you most people that dress up on Christmas they don't want to dress up they're not comfortable they're stiff they're mannequin like and but yet in people's minds it's like we've got to conjure up and make this little thing happen for us to have peace and joy it's all great until the drunk uncle shows up or the turkey somebody leaves the guts in it or you know, somebody doesn't get what they wanted. And then all of a sudden, all these little sentimental things and these, these perfect little ideals of what things should be begin to crumble, begin to falter. You know, that's a worldly peace. It's carnal. It's not God. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying Jesus has another peace that really is about who he is, not just what he has to offer. It's his peace. You can't earn it. You can't negotiate for it. You can't buy it. It's not situational. It's not circumstantial. It doesn't come and go with the wind. It's a deep-seated peace rooted in the relationship that we have with him. If we have a relationship with Jesus, if we spend time abiding, if we depend on him, if we give him the things that are in our, are in our heart, the good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, the regretful, on and on and on and on, we'll have a peace. It's otherworldly peace of Jesus. Otherworldly, it's spiritual, it's not circumstantial. You know, one statistic said that there is only one group in all the categories, men, women, age, demographic, in any demographic that is doing now better than they were last year, one group, and it's people that belong to religious organizations. People that have a relationship with God or some sort of faith community are the only group in any demographic, that are doing better now than they were a year ago. And I think that's a, that's a strong statistic. His peace, Jesus' peace, is transcendent. It's the peace of God that Paul refers to in Philippians. It's a peace that passes all understanding. What does that mean? It's not 
logical. It's transcendent. I like to say it like this. I know I have the peace of God when my circumstances tell me I should be freaking out right now, but I'm not. That's the peace of God. It's transcendent. You know, I reflect over this year and you know, by the grace of God, even during lockdowns and quarantines and everything being shut down, I was still able to make it to Pakistan three times and Haiti once and Puerto Rico once. You know, I mean, that, that's a gift to me. And, you know, I've taken eight COVID tests in the last three months and, you know, haven't, haven't got it. Praise God. Thank God. But this peace is transcendent. You know, I think about a couple situations that I was in uh, in other countries, and let's just say they were precarious. They were a little dangerous. Um, they could have had some bad outcomes. And, and, and as I'm looking at the situations, two of them, I'm thinking, okay, I know me, and logically, this should really cause some fear and anxiety. But there wasn't any there. And that, that has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my courage or anything like that. It has everything to do with the fact that my peace is rooted in who Jesus is and who he is in me. And it's a fruit of the spirit that needs to be cultivated. And I can tell you, logically, I thought I should freak out right now. But in my heart, it was peaceful. It was still. And I was thinking thoughts like, I hope my wife doesn't find out. She'll never let me out of the country again. <laughs> I'm back. It's good. Think about this right now. The peace Jesus has to give is rooted in his identity and his personhood. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says this great verse. For he himself, himself, the person of Jesus, is our peace, who has made us one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. We have the peace of God because we have peace with God. And it's not because of anything you and I have done, any pledges, vows, religious rituals. There's no earning behind it. It's rooted in what he did. I want to leave you with three questions for deep reflection. These are not shallow questions. These are deep questions regarding you and the peace of God. And here's the first question. I just want to ask you, do you really want peace? I mean, really. Do you really want peace? Now, you may be sitting there saying, well, duh, of course. That's absurd. Who wouldn't want peace? I never assume people do. Any more than Jesus presumed that a blind man named Bartimaeus wanted to be healed of his eyesight, healed of his blindness. I mean, you think about it. If Jesus comes to a blind man, isn't it obvious what he wants? But yet Jesus asks the question, what do you want me to do? He doesn't presume. He said that I might see. And Jesus touched him and healed him. And his eyes opened and he went on his way. So that's a deep question. Do you really want peace? Second question is, how far will you go to get it? How far will you go to get it? I mean, 1 Peter, we went through that book in the summer or, early, or late spring. 1 Peter 3, verse 11 says, Let him turn away from evil or deviate from evil and do good and let him seek peace. Pursue it aggressively. Pursue it. Now, I mean, how, how easy do you let go of relationships? How easy do you, when you're offended, write people off? How far will you be willing to go to make peace in a fractured relationship? Will you own your part of what went wrong in that relationship? Or are you stuck in the habitual blame game? It's always somebody else's fault. Will you ever own your own stuff? Will you ever go after a relationship that's been lost and broken? You know, when you get convicted, will you go and repent to someone? I can think of three relationships that I had that I had been convicted for years off and on. And after 12 and 15 years, I, I had to track down these people, make amends to them, own my hurt to them, my lack of kindness. And you know what? It was forgiven. That, you know, those things, that conviction that keeps lingering keeps coming back to you, pay attention to that. Respond to it. That's where you get peace. And then the third question is, what is Jesus asking you to do now? You know, Paul said in Romans chapter 12, if it's possible so far as it depends on you, 
live peaceably with all men. So I don't know what he's asking you to do, but I pray that I've been talking. The Holy Spirit's been working in you. And so I'm going to pray for you right now. And I realize that at this time of year, boy, there's just a lot of ugly feelings that can come up. A lot of pain from the past. A lot of regrets. A lot of broken relationships. I would not stand here and talk to you if I, if I didn't 100% believe with certainty that Jesus is who he says he was, who he is, who he says he is, and that he has for you and I what he has to give. And that's a part of himself, the peace of God that passes all understanding. So, Father, right now I pray for every person right now that is watching this, every person that is going to watch this. I pray your Holy Spirit is at work in the life of every single person, young and old. And I pray that you are prompting them. I pray that you are encouraging them. And I pray that you're convicting them. I pray that you would reveal where we have placed our hope and our trust in uncertain things, in natural things, in carnal things. Um, God, I pray that people would hear this as an invitation to abide in you. And as we abide in you, we realize you abide in us. And then peace is our portion that does pass all understanding. So I pray that people that need healing right now during this time in their heart, I pray that people are, that are really anxious and restless in their heart, I do pray they would hear the words of Jesus, peace, be still, and that your heart would be settled, and that we would do what Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, that he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on him. God bless you, church. I love you. I pray that you have a great week, a great Christmas that's full of hope, joy, peace, and healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.